Shavua Tov everyone and uh, welcome to our weekly parasha and Chodesh Tov, this is Parashat Vayigash and Rosh Chodesh Tevet. So, what is Parashat Vayigash and what's the connection to Rosh Chodesh Tevet and the month of Tevet which is Capricorn? Let, let's see, as we, we, of course we cannot understand the parasha without, without understanding last week's parasha. Okay, it's still connected. Last week's parasha, we were still in the story of Joseph. Joseph is going to Egypt, coming out of the of jail, becoming the person in power in Egypt. And then, as he foresaw, there were seven years of plenty and seven years of famine after that. And because of the famine, it was always all over the Near East. Jacob, who lives in the land of Canaan, Israel, is hungry. The whole family is hungry, so they send the boys, the sons, Jacob, uh, Jacob's sons, they send them to 10 of them. Joseph is gone. Benjamin is staying with Yaakov, and they go down to Egypt to bring food. They buy the food. However, Joseph is waiting for them, hunting for them. He, they are brought to him, and he blames them. That's last week, uh, Parashah, Miketz. He blames that they are, they are uh, spies. They came to hurt Egypt and so on, and they have no idea what is this about. It says that as they're being attacked by Joseph, they don't know it's Joseph. They can't tell it's him. Okay? So uh, as they attack, he attacks them. And, of course, and there is a translator. Joseph, uh, he uh, plays like he's an Egyptian. Okay? So there's a translator to speak to them uh, Hebrew, which was the language of uh, the land of Canaan of that time. And then it says that he attacks them and they start to, uh, to react to it. And Reuven is saying, I told you, I told you not to listen to the boy, Joseph. Because we didn't listen to, to Joseph. When he said, please, my brothers, get me out of the pit. Don't sell me as a slave. Now it happens to us. So as they speak about it, they say, maybe this is our payment. Okay, Joseph turns around, he cries. Why, Joseph, why don't you tell them that it's you? Okay, he wants them to be ready. He wants to see that they are really uh, transforming this, uh, fixing the, the terrible thing they did to him. It's, still, it's not finished. Okay, so he tells them to go back to Canaan and bring Benjamin. He says, he it, it is arresting Shimon. Shimon is the one that wanted to kill him in the first place. The leader of the kid, the ones who wanted to kill him. He is being arrested. He said, you can't have Shimon and you can't have food the next time if you don't bring Benjamin to prove that you're not spies. They bring Benjamin. He's so nice to them. He gives them all the food and so on. They go back, but they're being framed. He orders, Joseph orders to put his, his wine goblet, silver wine goblet, in Benjamin's uh, bag. They're being chased on the road. Why did you steal the goblet of my master, says the messenger of uh, Joseph. And they say, we'll be all your slaves and the one who stole it will ki be killed because they know they didn't do it. They were so naive. They were framed. They're being brought in and now they're standing in front of Joseph and he says, no way, it's, it's okay. The one who stole will stay over here as my slave because he's a thief. You can go back to your father. And they are in shock. So, the last verses, it's all about cliffhangers. It's like the best, uh, the best uh, soap opera ever. Okay. So then the end of Parashat Miketz, uh, it says, chapter four, uh, 44, verse 15. Well, what have you done? I'm, I'm not a person that can be fooled. I can see things. Vayomer Yehuda, so Yehuda says, Ma nomar l'adoni, ma nedaber, ma nitzadak. What can we say to our, to our master? We can justify ourselves. God found our sins. So we, we are paying for our sins. That's what Judah is saying. Yehuda is saying, we are slaves to the, to the master. We, we are, and whoever the goblet was found with. And Joseph is answering, 
God forbid I should do that. The person that the goblet was in his hands, he will be my slave. Go back to my father. And that's over. We parashat Mikets. We read it yesterday in the synagogue. So, parashat Vehigash is starting the next verse. It's uh, Genesis 44, verse 18. And now there is a whole discussion. What do we mean? We already said that Yehuda, they were in the middle of a conversation. Yehuda, the brothers, Yehuda became the speakers of the, of the brothers, and Joseph. Why Vaigash? Vaigash means it being translated usually as approached. Yehuda approached him. But a lot say Vaigash, it was, it's coming from the Shorish Nun Gimel Shin, Hit Nagshut. Yehuda collided. So the sages are trying to explain there was a kind of a threat. Yehuda was upset. They're going to take the aid are framed. Justice is being hurt over here. And he's like, he guaranteed. When Jacob said, I'm not, I'm not letting Benjamin to go to Egypt. What if he doesn't come back? I lost Joseph. Now losing Benjamin, that would be too much. I lost my wife. Rachel, I lost the mother, I lost the first brother, now the second brother. I won't be able to withstand that uh, shock. And Yehuda finally convinces Jacob by saying, I guarantee for him in this world, in the other world. For Yehuda, this means a loss of everything. Okay? Now remember, Yehuda in the last parasha, he didn't get, it, it was not that easy in two weeks ago in Vayeshev. After, remember, the story was like this. Shimon wants to kill Joseph. Reuven is not saving him. He says, you know what? Instead of killing him, let's meanwhile, before we decide what we do, let's throw him into the pit. Dangerous enough. Then Yehuda wants to save him. He says, let's sell him as a slave. At least he will be alive. Maybe we can find him later in Egypt. In Egypt. Both Reuven and Shimon and Yehuda are kind of trying to make it nice. Both fail. Joseph disappears, they have no idea where he is. Okay? Now, the, the moment that happened, you know, like in any good uh, soap opera, we are like anxious, what happened to uh, Joseph? He's sold as a slave. No, another picture, Vayered Yehuda me'el me'al echav. Yehuda goes down, and there's another scene, Yehuda, it says, goes down from his brothers. Why go down? You sold your brother. A, this is horrible, like morally. B, you know, it says in the Torah, Gonev ishu mot yumat. The person who steals another person and sells him to slavery should be death sentenced. Okay? Because the moment the person is a slave, he has no life. It's like killing him. He, Yehuda, gets married. He has three sons. The first dies. The second dies. The third, Yehuda is afraid to give the same bride to the third. All story. Finally, Yehuda gets the bride. His, his daughter, you know, he gets her pregnant. Two boys are being born. It's a whole mess up. He didn't have it easy till now. He's paying already for what he's done. Okay? Now, We'll see how it goes, what's in it for us, and now Hanukkah and Rosh Chodesh Tevet. And then, so Vayigash Elav Yehuda, there's a whole issue about what really happened over there. Because, as the Orach Haim HaKadosh, Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar says, Vayigash Elav, Lama Utsach Lomar Vayigash? Why does it have to say Vayigash? Achar Shekarov Elav Haya Medaber Imo Adata, he was already talking to him. Rashi, it, it says, Haya... Karovelav, and the Zohar also says, why do you have to say Vayigash should be? And Yehuda said to Yosef, what's the collision over here? And that's, in order to understand that, we have to understand that we are entering the month of Tevet. And the month of Tevet, Tevet Capricorn, is ruled by planet Saturn. And planet Saturn, or Shabtai in Hebrew, is symbolized wisdom and universal laws. What does it mean? Pay time. Pay time. This is a month you have to face the truth. 
If you do not face the truth genuinely, authentically, which means you want to get by, you just want to make it easy, nicey, nicey, and that means that planet uh, Saturn is the big teacher. How? With big slaps in the face, in the behind, on your feet, somewhere, and you learn from that, from that uh, hits that you get. So the message of planet of, of the month of Tevet is you have to learn, take the lesson, that's the only way you grow. And you have to go by the rules. You can't go around the rules. You have to face it. Okay? And the rules are the rules. I'm not talking about, you know, a person makes himself some rules about diet. No, we're talking about the rules who are universal and everlasting. This is what planet uh, Saturn symbolizes. This is what Parashat Vayigash is about. Here we have the story of Yehuda, and it's paid time. On one hand, he's standing there with the brothers and the whole universe, all their world. You know, till now, somehow, they kind of lived by the fact with this horrible, horrible secret what they did to Joseph. They are the only ones who know about the secret. Their father doesn't know it. Nobody in the world knows what they did. Can you imagine living with such a horrible secret? But every person is a horrible secret. I'm not talking about that, that size. Not everybody is selling his brother to slavery. Nobody kills one of his family members. But every person is his own stuff that he, he knows deep inside this is an issue I did not take care of, and I'm somehow trying to get by. And one day, you have to face, you know, your actions, because the rules are there's a cause and effect. And what does it mean, a cause and effect? So you'll see. So the Zohar is explaining to us, and that's what's amazing. And the Zohar talks about the creation of the universe. And he says the universe has been created. Uh, and there's two legends the Zohar is bringing. One legend is... The whole world was created nicely, the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, sixth day comes, and, and, and God wants to create Adam. And the Torah that was created before, if the world is just being created, how come the Torah was created before? So you have to understand that that, that legend is saying something that the Torah, according to... Uh, many, many legends that you could be found in many, many ancient places. The Torah was created, some legend says, thousands of years before the world was created. Who was there to count? But this is a legend, remember. What the legend is saying, that God was looking in the Torah and created the world looking at the Torah. I mean, God needs a, you know, man, you know, a, construction book we understand but if you study Kabbalah you, you make it easy the Torah is basically the DNA of the Holy Universe how do we know that so the sage is saying okay if the God had to look inside the Torah to create the world we can understand let's say we understand why do we need to have the Torah ourselves do we need to create another world no so why do we need the Torah you understand from that what the sages are saying yes the Torah is the DNA code of the universe we are not studying the Torah not as a tradition because that's not a tradition we're not studying it as a religion because it's not a religion this is a technology of how the universe is structured why do I have as a human being to learn the Torah because if you don't learn to set yourself with the rules of course you cannot get from life what is what's in it for you like anything you buy this most amazing powerful machine but you never bother to read the law the rules how to operate it you know what if this machine is designed so beautifully so in, it's intuitive you know it's intuitive you don't have to read the uh, the manual but there are so many functions that you will never know how to get the benefit of them because you never read the manual. 
because you don't even know this 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 is a available for you to use so you live let's say with a let's say it's a machine that you can get 100% out of it you get only 10% out of it because all of these functions you got to don't even imagine that those functions are there for you it can make your life easier now we are talking about not just a manual of a machine we talk about the manual of the machine which is the whole universe as one big machine we are to study how it works why when I know how it works I know also when something goes off course how to fix it okay and that is what the story of this parasha is about it's about getting the best what you can they did not behave by the rules what's the reality they're trying somehow to go by crisis management okay Joe Jacob is right now in depression he's upset for so many years he can't overcome the loss of Joseph okay that's enough to have the f whole family under that cloud whenever you're passing by where jo Jacob is you have to walk on your toes he can't joke and, and and laugh loudly because you don't want to disturb him because he's he's mourning his son okay how can a family function like this of course not all the brothers are holding that secret inside now and they're trying to get by and now it hits them he can't get by anymore you have to do something about it because now it got so complicated Shimon is in jail Benjamin is going to become a slave and it's exploding and Yehuda who guaranteed by betting on his life and his next life he said the in this world and the next world it looks like it can't go worse than that and Yehuda is doing something really amazing and so when he says he approached him let's see what the Zohar says so the Zohar speaks about the creation why does he have to speak about the creation because it's about this is the time the next month it's about looking in the face of the universe and saying there are rules of the universe of cause and effect I can't ignore the rules simply I cannot ignore the rules so either you use that because the energy of Capricorn is having the rules and going around with guilt okay and which is also against the rules you cannot go on with guilt without that exploding in your face it's a it's a time bomb going around with the guilt with a secret like this it's a time bomb it's going to explode sooner or later so you have to do something sooner before it's the price is going to be so high maybe you're not able to pay the price okay the next thing is that's so the Zohar is bringing another legend when the world was going to be created something happened the letters marched the Hebrew letters march in front of God it's another legend here it's such a like a very short version of the legend they started from Taf the last letter all the way down each one of them came to God and said God you should create the world with me first that is before the Torah even it's a very nice legend however legends are basically a truth covered with a story okay and many times a big secret and what's the secret over here the first letter came it was tough and God said to tough you cannot they cannot create the world with you because you are the end it says that the letter in the Zohar that the, 30 days before passing on of a person the letter tough appears on their forehead okay on the forehead not every thank God nobody not everybody can see that most people cannot see it because I don't know if you can go with that truth around okay now so of course if the letter tough symbolized the end okay end of story yeah, we can start the world on it so then the, it continues with some of the other letters it doesn't speak about all of them but then it comes to the end of the story the end of the story of this legend is when the letter bet which is number two from the end b bet a b c alphabet you know alphabet is hebrew there's only one language it means something hebrew okay later on because all the hebrew most of the other languages 
are using uh, letters that are somehow derived from the Hebrew ancient alphabet, so they are called the same same words. Okay, so when it comes to the bet, and bet means a house. Okay, bite. And then God said to the letter bet, I will create the world with you, and therefore the Torah starts with the letter B, with the letter bet. Bereshit. Why? Because Bereshit, bet, the letter bet is bracha, bliss, a blessing. And the whole world is about that only. And there's no negative blessing. If it's negative, it's not a blessing. All the world is about is just about, that's why the world was created with the letter bet first. Now, what about the letter Aleph, which is the first letter? And the Aleph symbolizes all, light. But if you add to the word or, light, a resh, one resh, it becomes arur, cursed. Both start with the letter Aleph. Light can become a curse. If you're not using it according to the universal laws. What does it mean? Oh, we'll come. So what does it say? The Torah, it says that the Torah came to God on the sixth day and said, God, you're going to create humanity, Adam, that's humanity. You have to know that humanity is going to make you upset. So, you know, you should consider that. And God said, but one of my name is Erech Apaim. Patient and tolerant. That's my name. And therefore the world was created with tolerance. What does it mean tolerance? That when we make a mistake, the payment does not come immediately. There's a time. What does it mean? During that time, we have the ability to fix, to pay back, to learn, to make amends. This is what this world is about. It's about making mistakes and fixing them on or on on. If it was not with tolerance and with this kind of cushioning system, the moment you make a mistake, you pay, nobody will dare to make any move in their lives. Because, you know, it, when you do things, you make mistakes. And as we said in the previous weeks, the righteous fall seven times and gets up. The wicked don't get up. Why? They don't, they don't have hope. What makes a person righteous? Hope. Hope. The first thing. What I mean hope? Knowing that the current situation, this is not the final deal. Knowing that what if the end is well, all is well, and if it's not well, it's not the end. Which means then another round and another round. We are in the world of tikkun. Tikkun means we're in fixing. We're fixing. We're in an ongoing process of fixing. Now, that means that we have something very special over here, then the Zohar continues. Rabbi Yitzchak and Rabbi Yehuda are sitting in the night. I'm reading in the Zohar, verse 10, uh, where it says about Rabbi Yehuda, and Rabbi Yitzchak and Rabbi Yehuda, they were sitting one night and studying Torah. And says Rabbi Yitzchak to Rabbi Yehuda, we learned, Ki kasher bara kadosh baruchu et ha'olam, when the Creator created the universe, aside olam ha'tachton ke'en olam ha'elion, one of the major concepts of spirituality. He created the world up and down. The spiritual world and the physical world, above and below, as above, so below. Everything that is below, is only a shadow of what's happening above. Okay? So there's a root in the real spiritual world and there's a physical branches that what we can perceive in our consciousness, this is this is only the lower world. Okay? Now, so then why is that important? Because when the Zohar is saying, when we're speaking about the letters and the creation of the world, you have to understand the Zohar says that Remember, we spoke about the letter bet and about bliss. So, wh why do we have to speak? Why, why do you have to speak about the legend about the creation of the world, by the and the creation of the letters? 
Oh, so the Zohar says like this. When we say a blessing, we say, we always, every blessing starts, Baruch Ata. Now, Baruch is a blessing. But, but Baruch means it's a third body, right? Okay? He, Baruch. He is Baruch. The blessing is. Why? Because this is the bliss when it is in the spiritual upper world. Okay? Then comes the word Ata. And whoever speaks, there are many languages that you, that you talk to somebody important in plural, right? Okay? Like in French, vous, instead of, right? Du. Or uh, toi. You have in many European languages, you have that. Even in English, when you say you to somebody important, you mean you in plural, not you in single. Although the sounds the same. In Hebrew, you in plural is atem. You in, in single is ata. So when we speak to God, we say baruch ata. How? It's like a lot of people when they study Hebrew. It's like, how come you tell God ata in second body? He's not your friend. You should speak, you should have been saying atem. Baruch atem. Okay? If you're talking to God. But it's very weird, you say ata. The Zohar explains over here, no. Baruch, the saying the word Baruch is awakening the bliss. Where? In the upper world. That's why it's a third body. Because it's beyond your sight and your recognition and your ability to perceive. Beyond our perception. But the second word is Ata. And what is Ata? Ata, the word Ata, does not really mean you. It means Aleph to Tav, A to Z, to He, this He is the physical world, the recipient. The light of the Creator is the giver, and this world is the recipient. Okay? So when you say, so what, the jo what is the job of a human being? The job of the human being is to connect with a higher consciousness. To the hidden world and then bring down the light to manifest in the physical world this as we said last week is the whole thing about the miracle of Hanukkah because we said what is the story of Hanukkah what's what's the whole story of Hanukkah is about a human being has one purpose we're not here to breed breed we're not here to own uh, physical stuff because we can't take it with us we can't even take our children with us okay thank God Okay, all of that, we are for one purpose. Our purpose is to bring the spiritual light down to the physical world and light the physical and turn it on. Okay, and that is the blessing, Lehadlik Ner Hanukkah. To light means in Hebrew to turn on. To turn on this world. And Ladlik Ner Chanukah is initials Nachal, a river, which is a holy name, also Notzer Chesed Dalafim. It's all about bringing the bliss from above to below so it will be seen and be felt. So, you can have a builder who builds houses, but people can't feel at home in the houses because it's not comfortable. Okay, so you bring a designer or an artist, and he brings life into the house and makes it a home. There are people that who know naturally to bring the touch, we call it. That's called being professional. What is professional is the ability to, for every human being to have this fairy dust and to instill it in everything that you do. That's called Baruch Ata. Take the blessing, the bet, Baruch, Bracha, Ata, make it manifest A to Z here in this world when the Greeks said to the Jews we're talking about 22 centuries ago no you can't ever be able to do that you can never make magic you can always enjoy only the physical what you see is what you get and the Jews were saying if I cannot bring the upper world to the low if I cannot connect the divine to the mundane 
What for? You might as well kill me. I don't need my body. I don't need my wealth. I don't need my family. What for? We have one purpose, human beings. That's a universal law. We are not here for the physical only. Yes, we are for the physical. Only one, one condition. When you can light and turn on the physical by injecting the bliss, the divine bliss into the physical. Whatever you do. And that's why in Judaism you have a blessing to everything you do. Everything you enjoy. Why? Because you, just, you, just, you don't just want to eat a nice tasty fruit. You want to enlighten that and make it a divine experience. Okay? And that's, that's what it is for. Now, so when we understand that, we understand that you have two universes. And then the Zohar says, when we talk about it, now we go back to what's in it for us. Why Yehuda has to approach Joseph, collide with him. Some say that there was a war. They were threatening each other. They were going to kill each other. They, why are you using that? And some say, no, Yehuda, if you read, he comes with a lot of passion and love. And he says, you know, what come, what's coming from the heart is getting, can go into the heart. And he simply speaks to, from the heart. So there are a lot of versions to explain what's going on. Yeah, there was something on the edge of violence. Why? Because Rabbi Yehuda Patach, so I'm reading now from the Zohar, verse 23. Rabbi Yehuda opened and said, Ki lachim no'adu. His verse is, is, is quoting from the verse, Psalms uh, 48, the kings joined together. Yosef was the king of Egypt. Yehuda was, from Yehuda came out King David. He was also a king. There was a collision of two kings, symbolizing each one of them two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of heaven, and one is the kingdom of earth. Okay? These are Yehuda and Yosef. Both were kings. They, they collided into each other to argue. Both together. Okay? So we have a mix over here. For Yehuda on the physical plane, he's fighting for his universe. He's going to lose the upper world and the lower world. He can't get by anymore. You came to a corner in which you have to make it happen. He gives everything he has. He risks everything he has. You know how it is? Let's explain. Yehuda is a symbol of us. Malchut. What is Malchut? It's our world. It's our body. It's our minds. It's our wealth. It's our possessions. It's the consciousness of I am here in this world. Yosef is a symbol of the upper world, and the gate to the upper world is Firat Yesod, Tzadik Yesod Olam. The Tzadik is the foundation, Yesod, of the whole world. Why? Because this mundane world can be fed and with bliss only through Yesod. Says Rabbi Ezekloria, when he speaks about charity, says the world needs Hasadim, the bliss of loving mercy and loving kindness. This bliss comes from the upper spherot, from the upper world. But it comes like, if you can imagine, pipes, spiritual pipes, and it works like powder. When the powder comes through the pipes, the powder has a tendency to clog and become chunks. So when you want that to open up, you need to have that spiritual enlightenment and excitement in a way that you simply elevate yourself with so much devotion, intention, and overcoming all the chattering inside of, okay, well, you know, physical, 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 logic, 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 but what about the meaning of life? What about the values of life? What about that the values and the meaning come before the physical body? When a person reaches that place that he does, it doesn't matter what, talking to someone, building something, doing something, making decisions, but it, it does with, with an, a blow 
of emotional devotion of sacrifice and and offering yourself and everything you know to the divine to the upper upper world can you imagine that eruption this movement of going elevating which is called from bottom to up from bottom to top from below to above this this act this movement which is called also female water like a gazer Female water is like the water that usually come down by the rain and then being soaked by the earth and then it goes again out there. But when it comes up, it's magical. As a spring, especially a geyser. Why well, it's against nature. It's against, that's, that's what happens to a person. That his nature is to get by and to somehow to cover up for things and, and just let, let life go on. When a person puts an end to it, like Yehuda over here. He plays for the whole world. He is a gazer himself. When that Sfirat Malchut, which is the me, the mind, the, my world, my life, it's, there's nothing there. It's like, it's a takeoff moment. When that takeoff moment comes, you go up and then you collide with Sfirat Yesod, the upper world. When you collide, the Arizal is saying, that hit, it's not easy for the body, it's not easy. You have to break all kinds of perceptions about yourself. You have to get rid of so many chains and boxes of thinking. It's like, this is like the real epitome of going to be free. You collide with the upper world. The collision, if it's strong enough, says the Ari, when you bit up the pipe with all of that clog powder, the powder open, unclogs and it starts to flow down. Like a piñata. Okay? You want to, what's a piñata in, the, in the South America? You have this game, it's like a big, big container full of candies and presents and stuff like this. But you have to hit it from below so it opens up and then everything falls on you. That's Vaiga Shalav Yehuda. And Yehuda collided with Yosef. He was willing to give himself up. What he's saying to Yosef? Look, I can't, I'm not able to see my father hearing the second calamity coming that Benjamin said over here. I beg you, take me instead. Make me your slave. Send him home to his father. At that moment, in the story okay again we have two ways to look at it because that moment in the story it says uh, chapter 45 verse 1 Velo yachol Yosef leitapek. and Joseph could not hold himself anymore Okay, so the story is, he started to scream, everybody get out of here, except from the brothers. And then when everybody got out, they are in shock, standing in front of him, what's going on? And he says, I'm Joseph. And I, in even more, bigger shock. Okay? And then suddenly, Joseph says, look, there are five more years of famine. Bring dead, go to dead. Bring him over. Say Joseph is alive, and we will have here all, all what's all the fortune of Egypt is ours. Can you imagine the turn of the story? Like you can't have a more abrupt change. One moment their life is falling apart. The other moment, not just that Benjamin is not becoming a slave. Joseph appears, and you know what? He's the king of Egypt. Like. The whole, the whole big aching nut sitting inside each one of them, choking them for years, and they can't even talk about it, opens up and is solving itself in the most unexpected way. Same thing. When we go with that passion and devotion, 
leaving all the nonsense of the physical world, just living our life with excitement, doing something above our nature, about our com above our comfort zone. When we create that movement from below to above, the mind not being the female water, like the gazer movement from below to above, you hit Sfirat Yesod and the Yesod opens up, all the bliss comes down. When the bliss comes down, the whole story changes. Why? Because when the light of the Creator comes in, the darkness goes away. What happens when the darkness goes away? We have no idea. The logic that our logic has been developed during the dark times has no idea how it looks like in the light times. Right? Somebody was blind all his life. Now they make an operation he can see. He has to learn how to figure out shapes, colors. He doesn't know what does it mean. He doesn't know how to translate the messages into you haven't been in the light yet. So don't try to impose the logic of the old box on the logic of the solution. Because the solution is outside the box. When does that happen? When you simply go by the rules. And going by the rules means also, I'm not here just to breed, eat, survive. I'm here to do magic. When every day I have to go through and try to find where's the magic. How can I turn someone's life on? How can I turn my life on? How can I find that devotion? And you know what? There's so many opportunities. There's so many opportunities, there's so many people you can touch just by a smile and just by a nice feedback or give somebody a push, make him think that somebody believes in him. There's so many opportunities, it's like everywhere, you just have to look around. Because when you do that and you start to live like this, then the Yesod opens up and the divine collides with the mundane and they become one. A team together. How do you say team in Hebrew? Tzevet. Tzevet, there's the same Shoresh also as Mitzvah. Mitzvah, does, it's not a commandment. Mitzvah, it's, a, it's teaming. It's an action through which, by your action, physical action, and by your consciousness and by your heart, with your heart and your will, you team together and you collide together till they merge the divine and the mundane, the upper world and the lower world. When you do that, then the real solution comes. As long as you don't do it by the law of the cosmos. You are basically, basically, you know, somebody, there's a company and they have a problem. So they call, they hire a new accountant. He plays with the numbers. So the papers looks nice. Does that mean that the problems are being solved? No, they're just being recycled. And somewhere, the next year, the year after, even you have the most magical accountant in the world, it will blow in your face. And this is the time, the month of Tevet, of paycheck, pay time. Pay time. Either you pay, this is the time the things blow that they were not taken care of in the past, because planet Saturn comes in and says, okay, how much do you owe? Let's see. Okay, let's take the house, let's take this, like that, that, bro. Okay, now you don't know anything. You're free. What am I free? He said, oh, you didn't need it anyway. <clears throat> That's Saturn. You didn't come to this world to just own stuff. You're here to team together the divine and the mundane. Oh, there's nothing wrong with having possessions and being healthy. And on the contrary, you should have possession. You should be healthy, whatever. But you have to Im imbue the upper world into it, you have to team them together. And if you do not do that, you're not living by the rules of the world. What happens now? When people try to live by the physical, the rules are very simple. Work, work, work. Own, own, own. Have, have, have. Take, take, take. The problem is, you get depressed. Why do you get depressed? You know, one of the meaning of the word depression, you know what's one of the meaning of the word depression? Depression is something like this. 
you had something, it was empty, and then it caved in. How do you call the hole that was created? A depression, right? So people are building success by owning things, by having things. All of them are truly one world only. Physical, elusive, materialistic. It's dead. It's, it was always dead. And one day it caves in and you realize it has never been there before. So what you are left with? Depression. Another depression, another depression, another depression. Wherever there was an ex you expected the feel of fulfillment, there's a depression. And it's aching. It's painful. How do you avoid creating a depression? And by the way, it's known that people of the sign of Capricorn are prone to clinical depression more than other people. Why? Because on one hand, you see they have this hunger. They need to feel safe. They need to acquire control. Where? On the physical mundane level. The more you get, the deeper is the depression that is being created when the bubble bursts. And what's left? You know, like when it's a uh, kind of you bake something and that there, wherever there was a bubble, there's a depression, right? Because the bubble bursts and there's a hole. So people go around with depressions. What's the depression? You had something. You filled yourself with something. With goals. You learn in business school. Make goals. You learn in, you learn in, in all kinds of uh, different uh, uh, workshops. You have to have goals. You make the wrong goals. You get fulfilled, it becomes a depression. You're going around with an aching hole. How do you prevent that from happening? The only way. You just do it by the law. And what is the law? What is the law? The law is simply bringing in the light to fill up the depression. That's the only way you can do it. Yet, you, now you have a vessel, fill it up, and now the whole story turns into the most amazing magical story. Joseph is alive. There is enough food for the whole family. Everybody can join together in richness and happiness. The whole clan together create a new nation. A new story begins. This is our life story. Each one of us. So if you find yourself in depression, it means a bubble have burst. And now you have to fill it up, fill it up by connecting to the divine. Thank you. Shavua Tov, happy week, and Chodesh Tov, happy month of Capricorn. Thank you.